Well, tonight uh, we're going to continue on why we fight. Uh, yes, I know it's the holiday season, but we are going to be encountering people during this season. Uh, and as we do, well, family, friends, all sorts of different people, I believe God is making opportunities because this time is precious to Him. We've come a long way to get where we are. And you're thinking, where are we? We're, <laughs> because it just takes time to get everything to that point where people begin to realize they need a Savior. Now, if you pray for someone to be saved, what do you think is going to happen? Is their life just going to get better and better and better until they finally, oh, wow, I need to be saved? That's just not the way it works. It, it works basically when you come to the end of yourself. So when you pray for a nation to be saved, what do you think is going to happen? And that's sort of where we are. So in this part two, I want to discuss something that says good doesn't tolerate evil. It just, it can't. Good cannot tolerate evil. So the scripture that I'm, well, was given for this is out of Revelations 2.20. It says, but I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now, this is from the church of Thyatira. And the interesting thing here is this really isn't the judgment against Jezebel. It's the judgment is against those who tolerate Jezebel. Now, we're thinking that this is, okay, somewhere in this church is this woman named Jezebel. And she's causing all these problems and we need to throw her out. And... And that's, that does happen. We know that, right? Isn't that to see all the churches destroyed by Jezebel, how she comes in and sows division and all that? That's true. But there's another view of this that I want to talk about. Because you see, the Jews missed a lot of, of Jesus' first coming because they didn't really understand. They expected him to come and throw out the Romans, right? They said, you're our Messiah, like God always does. He basically goes and throws all the evil people out and reestablishes Israel and blesses them, right? But in all those cases, he really deals with his people first. So when they didn't understand the prophecy, they assumed that he was going to come and establish his kingdom and throw out the Romans and change the government and the whole thing. But he didn't. He ended up focused on the individual. So, yes, they were slaves, but he came to deal not with slaves from another nation, but slaves to sin. So he was focused on the individual because what judgment comes to the house of the Lord first, right? Isn't that the way it works? So he came to deal with us personally. And we see him in that role. And a lot of gospel has come out of that looking at it. And I call it, uh, well, I, I call it the hireling gospel. The hireling gospel is all about you and what God can do for you. And because of this personal effect that he's had on us, rather than, I mean, let's face it, Jesus didn't deal with the Romans. So we seem to think that that's our role now. But the prophecies that the Jews were looking at we're talking about the Messiah who's going to come as king and rule over the nations. And those prophecies will be fulfilled. See, he's not coming back as, as the way he was as the Savior for our souls. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. He's coming back as government. That's why when we read the Revelation, it's hard for us to understand because we see Jesus... As, uh, as John saw him, hey, I'd lay my head on his breast and he loved me and all of this. But when he saw Jesus in the role that he's in now, what he saw made him fall on his face. Because Jesus is coming back as king. So John the Baptist, when he came, he came to convict the individuals of their sins. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for you. But I have a feeling that John the Baptist that we're going to see, the, wit the two witnesses and all the things that are coming are not really going to be at that level. 
they're going to be about the nations. Because he's establishing a kingdom. So these, the John the Baptist of this time, the Elijahs are going to come and speak to the sins of nations and peoples, not just individuals. So it's hard for us to see the scripture in this way. And that's sort of the, the way that we need to refocus and see these things. Because it's caused us to think of the hireling gospel. It's caused us to think that the church doesn't get involved in the political matters. We're just here about the issues of the soul, but not the soul of the nation, just the soul of the individual. But I'm telling you, he's coming back as king. And we need to be prepared for that because he's building a government to rule and reign over the world. And that's what we're in training for. And that's the issue. As we're making that transition, the church is having a little rough time in making that transition to understand their role. Can you see that? So when I look at this scripture, I have this against you as you tolerate the woman Jezebel. At first, you think of just some individual woman called Jezebel. But what if that's not what this is all about? What if there's some spiritual connotations here? That Jezebel means a whole lot more than one lady in this one church. So why did he even bother to put in the word woman, you think? Because she's a woman and he needs to say that? I mean, isn't the name enough? Well, the reason I believe is if you look at that word woman, it's translated woman there. But it's also often translated wife because it's about a helpmate and a wife. So it's a role that this person is supposed to have. It's not just their physical sex or even their gender. Um, I wouldn't call it a pronoun, but let's just say that it is describing Jezebel in a way that says there's a role here that Jezebel has. And so we're going to look at this spiritually tonight and understand why this is important, that we're able to see this at the global level and the nation, national level and the people level that God wants to deal with. So that's where we're going tonight. And, but we're still in the same situation. But if we look at this, you see the two pictures of the bride. And we decided, I think, that the bride is both of these, right? But does the church focus on one more than the other? Wouldn't you say they focus on the left? They're talking about being ready for Christ, and we should be. But what about the other side? What about the soldier? What does a soldier do? Is a soldier just there to, to protect themselves? Is that what a soldier signs up to do? No, he takes an oath to something much greater than him to protect something much, much greater, to even protect our nation. It's not about them. They would give their life to, to protect something. That's what the soldier part is. That seems to not be where the church is today. Can you see that? And that's what I wanted the shift to think, because now as you read the scriptures, we need to look at it in the eyes of Jesus as king, not just as Jesus as savior of my soul, my individual soul. We just can't look at it again like just the hireling gospel. We need to be seeing the gospel of the kingdom, which is what Jesus talked about. So last week we talked about standing firm against the enemy. And this is out of Ephesians 6. And why this is important, Ephesians is a very important book in these last days because it talks about the church, the last day's church, and the way the church will be. It starts in, what, chapter 2 and 3, talking about being built up into a larger temple as we, the individuals, are lively stones built into the temple. That though our body can hold the Holy Spirit, we're to be assembled into a temple that's going to hold a whole lot of Holy Spirit. A body, the body of Christ. How are we doing on that? Can you look around and see many pieces of the body of Christ? Or do you see a bunch of little churches that aren't working together and don't agree with each other? You see the problem. He's coming back for a bride, and that bride is one body. 
So in Ephesians 3 and 3, 2 and 3, it talks about that. Then he goes on to Ephesians 4, where he talks about the, the well, the fivefold ministry. And the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to assemble that body and bring it under the one head, right? To the mature man, right? And then you go on to Ephesians 5, when it starts talking about do not tolerate evil men, right? Don't tolerate evil. But also in Ephesians 5, it begins to talk about the bride. I'm talking about Christ and the church. So that means that you come together and you form this bride, and then he talks about he's coming back for a spotless bride, which is that one coming together as one. But then after that, we move to Ephesians 6, and that's where we are. You see, we're not dealing in casting out demons in Ephesians 6, are we? We're dealing in powers and principalities. That's not at a personal level. When Jesus walked the earth before, he dealt with casting out demons out of people, didn't he? Is that what this is talking about here? No, this is, we're talking about national and global situations, dealing with powers and principalities. And it's saying, finally, that's where we are. We're in the finally right now. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, because this is a spiritual battle. Put on the full armor of God that you can be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. See, that's not an individual demon that you cast out. That's a spiritual conspiracy. And you see all the different againsts here. Against the rulers, powers, and world forces. It doesn't say the ones bothering you. It says world forces of darkness and against spiritual forces in heavenly places. So this battle is not at an individual level. It's the corporate level. So can you see how we've, we sort of need to understand our role a little different? Therefore, take up the full armor of God to resist in the evil day. So when do you think the evil day is? Now. How about now? Very good. And having done everything, stand firm. So you can see where we are. And yes, we talked about last week. Yes, it is a conspiracy. Every generation has had to win the battle. And we fight against both domestic and foreign, right? That's what you take an oath of. Consider that natural and spiritual. We got to deal with both levels. It's not just a spiritual battle. It's a natural battle, world forces and spiritual forces. So can you see the transition that we're needing to make here? And that's what people need to see. That's when the church wakes up. It's not about just an individual revival. This is a national revival. We're dealing at a much higher level here. And I also threw in the scripture here, the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil, right? So what do you think the devil's purpose is? Destroy the works of God, wouldn't you say that? So there's a purpose here, and the battle is about the two kingdoms. Now you may think that the battle is inside of you between your, just the flesh and your spirit, but that's not the battle that he's called us to in these last days. He's calling us to a bigger battle. Can we see that? So we also talked last week about the, that God declares the end from the, the beginning. That he, he prophesies and lays out what's going to happen. And so there was a, a wedding in the beginning and there's a wedding in the end. But in the wedding in the beginning, though, there were two individuals, weren't there? But in the end, is this bride just one woman? Is he just going to pick one woman out of the whole world? No, the bride is, the, is us coming together as one. And the two shall be as one. Now the many will be as one. Make us one. Remember the prayer Jesus made in John 17? So that's why I'm saying we're dealing now in a corporate bride. And that's to take on a corporate enemy. And we need to see this picture. So it was said in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born and a son is given and the government will rest upon his shoulders. So what is the shoulders? If he's the head, who's the shoulders? We are. In order, basically in, in the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice, judgment and justice forever. So this is what he's trying to build is this 
bride that will he be ready when he returns because we don't have seven years of kingdom school after he shows up. He's got to set up a government quick. So this is, we are in the seven years of kingdom school right now. So that's why we need to understand what's going on. But there's also Babylon was in the beginning. And it will also be in the end. So it is the false government, but it's also the false bride. And who do you think the false bride is? There's where Jezebel is. And I'm going to show you that that's the case. That's what he's talking about here. It's not the woman Jezebel as just, it's the role of this false bride that we're talking about. So let's look at this because it's, Satan's government looks the same, right? He's got, okay, so we've got a little bit different version of this beast here. But, um, but you understand that the beast isn't like just some lady riding Godzilla out of, the, out of the sea like a Japanese horror movie, even though when you got it right down to it, this is the false Godzilla, right? And on it is not just riding one person, but that's the harlot of Babylon. That's your Jezebel. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came to me speaking and saying, Come here and I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Waters are the different people in different nations. So it sits across many of them. With whom the kings of the earth committed acts of sexual immorality. And those who live on the earth became drunk with the wine of her sexual immorality. Now, when you think of sexual immorality, I know we're probably thinking of adultery and things like that. But what if I told you that there is a, something greater in this area of what you consider sexual immorality? Do you know that there is a version of worship, goddess worship? Devil worship, it's very sexual in nature. It's perversion in the, by definition. Remember, establish and order it. What's the reverse? To, oh, that's what perversion is, is changing the order. So what this is, these, the rights that they had were sexual rights. So we just think of sex like oh, between man and woman. But no, we're talking about the perverted things that happen with children and all the other things that are involved in satanic worship are underneath all of this. And I know it's going to be hard to believe when this stuff gets exposed, but I'm telling you it's down there. And many of you have started to discover what it's all about, that these are sexual rights, but they're really perversion. And he carried me away the spirit to a wilderness, and I saw the woman sitting on the scarlet beast. There's the word woman again. But see, understand, that's not just some woman sitting on a beast. That's what we're talking about is the false bride. You, what, there are three women in the book of the Revelation, right? There's Israel, the bride, and the harlot, the false bride. So we need to see this a little bit differently. I'm going to continue because there's something else I want to show you here. This is continuing on in Revelation 17. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls, holding in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and unclean things of her sexual immorality. So this is like a bride that's all dressed up in beauty, right? Except for one thing. She doesn't hold a cup of covenant. She holds a cup of immoral things. We're going to see that what we're looking at out there in this governmental situation we think is a governmental situation, it's not. It's a battle between the devil and God. It's a battle of the evil kingdom and God's kingdom. And it's going to come down to that. And trust me, underneath that, you may think it's just politicians and government people. No. There's priestess. There's... There's all sorts of rites going on, sacrifices, that we don't even have any idea of. So that's what he's talking about here. Abominations, unclean things. 
and her forehead a name was written, Babylon, there it is at the end. The great mother of prostitutes and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. See anything wrong with that statement? Is that redundant? It's not. It looks like it's redundant. We mean the bloods of the saints and the witnesses of Jesus. Aren't they the same thing? So why I'm saying that's different things, when you look up the blood of the saints, that word saints isn't the saved people. It's the word hagios. The people that are basically holy or righteous, people that are pure and unblemished. Who are those people? Those are children. Can you see it? It's not redundant. The innocent blood. I'm just saying that there's stuff in here that we got to see a little bit differently. And it's going to be tough because people are going to wake up at some point and find this out. And you need to understand it. We need to understand what's going on here and say, no, this just isn't about a political party. This is, this is just satanic worship. And no, it's not just the sex trade slavery. This is perversion. This is, this is sacrifice of children, not just trafficking of children. So if we look back at the Babylon, we'll see that Babylon had a government, the first world government. And in that government, there was a king, Nimrod, and the wife, Semiramis. Now, Semiramis was the wife of Nimrod, often called Ninus, from Nineveh. That's just another name. King of Babylon. Many of the statues of Semiramis and her God incarnate son. Why did she have a God incarnate son? Because she wanted to be worshipped. Can you see that's an imitation of God? And what was going to come? The devil knew, so he basically said, I'm going to be a savior, except for one thing now. It's the woman who wants to be worshipped. This is the beginning of goddess worship. This was the religion of Babylon was goddess worship. It shouldn't surprise you because you can see why. Think of the, God creates an order, right? So what does the devil want to do? Prevert, pervert the order, right? Hence the term perversion. And that's, so you see that the devil would identify as taking the woman's role and exalting it over the man just because of the order. Now understand, I am not here saying that women are less than men. That's not the, we have roles. But understand, ladies, does your relationship with God go through your, a man or your husband? No. So there is a difference here. That's not part of that order. There is an order we're playing down here, but the women and the men both have equal relationships with God. If God tells you one thing and your husband tells you another, who are you going to obey? It's real simple, isn't it? So, but down here, there's a role he's trying to play because, and that's what we're looking at. Notice that these statues are all over the place. Why? Because God went and confused the languages and scattered them across the face of the earth, didn't he? Well, they all took this same goddess worship and the whole thing with the God incarnate son and put it into their religions where they were. So, yes, we see there's, it's there in Babylon. It's there in India. Um, it's here in Egypt. It's in Rome, of course, Mother Mary. And the Diana's at Ephesus. There's, it, it's all over the place because that's where it came from. Now, I'm not saying that if you're Catholic that you should not honor the Mother Mary. But if you're worshiping the Mother Mary, it's because they included goddess worship into Christianity so that they could include these people so they could rule the Roman Empire because goddess worship was very big. Because that's the devil wanting to be exalted over God. It's the same picture. And let's see if we can uh, show that. These are some of the different nations, and there's examples of the Nimrod, the Tammuz, and the Semiramis. Tammuz being the Messiah, and Semiramis being, of course, 
the Jezebel, queen of heaven, the whole thing. It's all through these religions. Why? Because it all came out of Babylon when they got separated. And they took it with them. So let's go back to another great empire, right? The Phoenician Empire. And look at Ezekiel 28. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, say this to the ruler of Tyre. Tyre and Sidon were the capital of the Phoenician Empire, right? The largest empire, and once again, attempt to be a global empire. This is what the Sovereign Lord said. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a god. I sit on the throne of a god in the heart of the seas. Remember, over the seas. But you are a man and not a god, though you think you are as wise as a god. So this is a man who's a ruler of Tyre. But can you see that we have another Babylonian picture right here? So Tyre and Sidon were these two cities that were right next to each other on the Mediterranean, and they ruled the empire. Well, let's look at who this man was. This man was Ethbaal too. He's the ruler of Tyre and Sidon during the time of Ezekiel. His predecessor namesake in the dynasty was Ethbaal. Well, Ethbaal won, but they don't call him that. He just called himself Ethbaal, which was 280 years before the time of Ahab. Ethbaal was, means priest of Baal, and that's what he was. And the original Ethbaal got the position by taking out the government and proclaiming himself king. And he is the priest of Baal. And his name means with Baal or possessed by Baal, Ethbaal. Baal meaning master, owner, lord, husband, or God. Can you see this? It's, a, it's an anti-type to God. So now we have two Ethbaals, Ethbaal 1 and Ethbaal 2. Ethbaal 2 was the one that Ezekiel was talking about. Let's look at Ethbaal 1. 1 Kings 16, 30 through 33. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, which is to create false gods, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, Tyre and Sidon. So who did he marry? The daughter of the devil, wouldn't you say? So who was Ahab? He was king of Israel. Can you see a problem here? When the, 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 the king of God's nation marries the daughter of the devil and began to serve Baal and worship him, he set up altars to Baal and the temple of Baal he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, of the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings before him. Now, what provoked him anger? Was it just disobedience? Is that what we're talking about here? No, he married the daughter of the devil, and he was supposed to be ruling God's people. You see anything going on here? Can you see what angers God and why he was angered at this situation? And by the way, the word Jezebel means Baal exalts or Baal is husband. So can you see how the picture is forming of what we're dealing with here? Let's go on in Ezekiel a little bit further, just a few more verses. And now we're bringing up another character in Tyre and Sidon. Only the other was the ruler, and now we have what's called the king. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You're in Eden, the garden of God in heaven, and every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, etc., your settings and mounting were made of gold on the day you were created, they were prepared. And finally, your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to earth. Is it all coming together now? Can you see it? Can you see the, who this is, of course? is Lucifer, who became Satan. But Lucifer was created to spend time in the garden of God, which means intimacy. So he was created as all this beauty, as almost like a partner to God, almost like a woman to God's male part. He was the, she would be the female part. 
Can you see that? And can you see why he wants to exalt the female over the male? Because it's a picture of him exalting himself over God. When he was in the Garden of Eden, who was it that he was able to tempt and sway? Was it Adam or Eve? So why would he do that? Because if he gets Eve to turn on Adam, and then get Adam and Eve to turn on God, he gets a twofer. <laughs> Can you see the picture now? What's going on here? Okay. Matthew 11. This is Jesus now. Red letters. Woe to you, Chorazin, and woe to you, Bethsaida. Now these are two of the cities, the three cities that Jesus preached in mainly. For if miracles that occurred in you had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, sound familiar? Yeah. They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. These are red letters, guys. Now, what does that say about us? Can you see a little problem here about tolerating Jezebel? That this isn't some little woman stuck in a church somewhere that we're upset at. So let's look at Thyatira, the church that tolerated Jezebel. The word Thyatira means continual sacrifice or constant labor, which is if you deal with Jezebel and let her rule over you, that's exactly where you live. Which is the slavery of Satan's government brings. However, the earlier name for the city Thyatira just happened to be Semiramis. What a coincidence. You remember Semiramis? Yep. Nimrod's, Nimrod's wife, the original goddess worship person? That was the original name for the city. No coincidence here. <clears throat> Semiramis, of course, was the wife of Nimrod who lived a few centuries after the flood of Noah. She was queen of ancient Babylon, head of mystery pagan religions, was worshipped as the mother of gods and the queen of heaven. Getting clearer. Let's look at the church of Thyatira. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, the son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze, say this. Now when he describes himself that way, what do you think is going to come next? I mean, when he has to say, I am the son of God, not Lucifer, I have flames like, a, eyes like a flame of fire, you're going to test with fire. I mean, and bronze, what does bronze represent in the Bible? It's judgment. If you look at word bronze, you'll see. Like the bronze statue, bronze is, is the, the feet, and that's judgment. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance. Yeah, you're persevering because you're in hard labor all the time. And it's love. Yeah, we love everyone. We accept everyone. We tolerate everyone, right? Does that sound like what we're hearing? We have great love and faith. We care about those people so much. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance. And that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Oh, we're out there spreading the love and, and the gospel all over the world. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. What are we talking about here? It's tell us exactly what we're talking about. Uh, acts of immorality, you're thinking, oh, they're, they're out there sleeping with somebody. No, it goes a lot further than that. And eat things sacrificed to idols. They, you understand, all these sexual rites were feasts. Yeah, you're seeing it. Do you know there's, there's actually movies out there right now on cannibalism? I mean, this is they're drinking blood and stuff. I mean, this is like, I don't know if you've heard of something called adrenochrome. Adrenochrome, most of you probably know what I'm talking about. I hate to say it, but <laughs> we probably need to keep moving. <laughs> yeah. 
I gave her time to repent, but she doesn't want to repent of her immorality. And they won't. They're not going to repent. I hate to tell you this, but if you're praying for the devil to get saved, you're probably not, you're probably wasting your prayers. <laughs> Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into, her, into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. So if you're involved in this sort of stuff, you're going to be in trouble. And I will kill her children with pestilence. Now, pestilence is like plagues, disease. So we won't even go into that situation. And all the churches will know that I am he searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan. Is this the deep things of Satan? As they call them, I place no other burden. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast till I come. He who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over nations. Are you seeing this now? What does it take to be one that rules and reigns with Christ? You must overcome Jezebel, and you cannot tolerate Jezebel if you want to operate and rule and reign with Christ. That's, that's the promise of those who overcome this. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of potter are broken to pieces, as I also received authority from my father. When was that? Psalm 2, remember it? Which is what it quoted. Yet I have set my king on the holy hill of Zion. I will declare and decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like potter's vessel. That was the father. That was the father giving that information. to the son, saying, I have given you the nations. So what did the son do? We just covered it. And I will, says that, I will give you the, what he gave me. You will share in that if you overcome this. How are we doing about this not tolerating Jezebel thing, you think, in our nation? You see the problem. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Second Thessalonians 2. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with his breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one who's coming in accordance with the activity of Satan. He's talking about, the, the, of course, the Antichrist, but we understand the beast is there. And this is when it manifests as a person. And all power and signs and false wonders, and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive a love as the, of the truth. So we need to love the truth. We need to seek it out. We need to find it. We must be wise, we must be ready, and we must love the truth. So that is why we fight. We will fight and win if we keep our faith. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you're showing us the truth. We want to know the truth. We want to be able to share your truth, Lord. We want to see who is going to wake up and who's going to choose you in the midst of this. Lord, we need to see this. We don't want to tolerate evil because good does not tolerate evil. And we want to be the good. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, for your words of truth to impart to us that we may stand and understand what we need to do in this time and in this season. We ask for your grace and your mercy and your 
the authority that you've given us by the power of your spirit to stand in this day. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.